Welcome to X-Men 97, episode two of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men animated recap podcast. I'm Rod. I didn't mention this last episode, but I've been drinking tonight, so this is going to get fun. (laughs) I'm GC, and we just recorded one really long episode right before recording this one, so this will be interesting. Also, yeah, still streaming on Sunday nights on Twitch on twitch.tv slash whiskey and waffles. That book Canuck, still not done. Last time I built it, kind of drunk, hoping it's not falling (laughs) apart right now. Cyclops is Waiting for Me is our weekly podcast series. We are going back and watching every single X-Men animated episode we can find. The podcast started with the original 1992 X-Men, the animated series. Building up to this, the release of X-Men 97. And just for this week, you're getting two episodes. And yes, our podcast feed may feel a little bit out of order because we had to take a break from X-Men Evolution during the release of X-Men 97, so we are able to recap these as close to their release as possible. Some quick reminders, we're a recap show about an episode that aired less than a week ago. There will be spoilers. If you don't want to spoil it for you, pause the podcast, watch the episode, and come back. And we are currently not sponsored by or affiliated with Marvel, Marvel Animation, Disney, or Disney Plus in any way. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Cyclops IWFM Pod on Instagram, TikTok, Threads, Twitter, and Facebook. Rod, I really got to remember to put the thread stuff. I don't oh. ever post it like i say it but i don't think i've posted any of the the reels and stuff like that that we've made there i don't know what to post on threads it's tough it's it it's gradually getting better i think they they just opened up beta for fediverse but it's not quite there yet i don't even know what word you just said oh it's the thing that blue sky's on someone correct me if i'm wrong how i had explained to me was oh it's another app i thought that was a thing inside of threads no it's it's protocol might be the right word i had to describe to me as like why you can send an email from one domain to another without having to be on the same platform. So basically, like, if you... Once again, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but this is how it explained to me. If you have a fan base on, like, Blue Sky, it doesn't live on Blue Sky. It's on a server that's, like, your own domain or someone else's domain that you're borrowing. And then when you go to another platform, it cross-platforms with, like, threads or something. So it's, like, you can take your following or whatever and community with you to other platforms and stuff. And it's all connected. Make sure to follow us on the favorite <laughs> podcast app of your choosing. Now onto the show. Today we're going to be talking about Season 1, Episode 2, titled Mutant Liberation Begins. It aired March 20th, just like the last one, 2024, and currently sits at a 9.2 star rating. I know why. On IMDb, we're going to get into this. This was an emotional roller coaster for me specifically. Hopefully uh, you've already I was I was expecting, you, like, after I watched it, I was like, did Rod cry during this? I cried and flipped tables. Let's we'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> because, okay, so... We just we just said it, but in case we didn't say it, if you haven't watched it yet, just go watch it right now. And I'm just Joe Russo, it. go watch right. the fucking episode because everybody knows if you've listened to me, or if you've even spent more than 15 minutes with me, you know that Storm has been my all time favorite character. Yeah, has nothing uh, to do with the podcast. That will just come <laughs> up in normal conversation with Rod after this episode. Uh, so this morning, when after the day after the episode aired, my brother actually called me to see if I was all right. <laughs> <laughs> He was like, I know we've been waiting for this for like 20 years. And it was funny because the ongoing joke on this podcast was don't fuck up Storm. And so the first episode was like, they didn't fuck up Storm. And then they gave like, her the most badass moment ever. Yeah. I was like, how did you do both? You you didn't fuck her up and then you did fuck her up. I'm kind of saying that half joking too because they didn't really fuck her up. But like, well, they, man, fucked, they, they fucked her. They didn't fuck yeah, her up. <laughs> they didn't. They took a twit. I will. Okay. So as I mentioned before, I had because we're in Los Angeles everybody is intermingled with each other you you just end up in places where there's like insight and stuff and so at the time years ago when this was starting production everyone who knew anything danced around this specific episode and i texted the ones that i still talk to now and it was like i got there and they knew exactly what i was talking about because this one just took so i don't know i was already excited about the first episode and watching it the second episode like actually took me through emotions involuntarily through the whole range so let's get into it my first thought yeah my first thought little little not related but kind of related i feel like this might be the first minor gaffe the previously on was not cyclops's voice yes i i feel you on that not bad just one of the one little touches that just wasn't there (laughs) but they did do the previously on so it wasn't something weird like last time on (laughs) x-mans my favorite the x-mans then the intro plays and it was different so you probably have the notes of what's different right there but i like how once again they're they're kind of showing off at this point how they can keep the same everything about it the vibe the energy but still be different but not feel different well it it kicks off by one 
Magneto is shown before Cyclops is. Yeah, because he's he's the leader. He's the leader. <laughs> he's in his like zaddy outfit. <laughs> right. And then the scenes that were in the previous one that were removed from this one, Rogue doing the sentinel toss, Beast landing on the pile, Cyclops shooting the sentinels, and then Storm in the danger room. All those get removed. Instead, we get an alternate angle that we never saw of the Callisto Storm fight scene from season one of X-Men, the animated series. Yeah, that's the one I was referencing last episode. It was like, I felt like that came out of nowhere. But I guess we are supposed to like see more Storm is the, the general. I think it's see more Storm, but also like kind of give us a reminder of the Morlocks too. Yeah, yeah. We see a Dark Phoenix flashback. We see Bishop still with his classic mullet that the internet is like, are they going to reveal why he changed the mullet? Like it's some big fucking character moment for him. It's like people's haircuts change of, over time, right. guys. I heard people say that about Storm. I was like, guys, it's been like half a year already. Just yeah. allowed to get a haircut. <laughs> and 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 also, also, Bishop could be from an alternate timeline. You don't fucking know what this man yes. has been through. Forge became a techno like half cyborg guy. But right. anyway. And then you also see Asteroid M. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So so what's funny is I mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, but my brother and I like it was like you know, we were already close, but we were bonding even more because this was one of the few things we didn't fight over as kids. Well, we fought over it, but we also enjoyed it together. So we were able to like kind of share in this experience again, him in his 30s and me in my 40s. And I was I mentioned this. I was like, yeah, I loved how like they could vary the intro. And and he was like, they did. I skipped it. I was like, what's wrong? Mother, with that, <laughs> that, that. that's against <laughs> episode canon. You are not allowed to do that. So he's like, well, not skipping the intros anymore. Like, yep. No, you definitely can't now. Like, it's like it's ingrained that, oh, there's going to be some level of foreshadowing in the episode. And like, I guess maybe that's the only reason that you would skip it is you're like, I don't want any hints as to what I'm getting in this episode. But I feel like even the hints they gave us, like, it's really hard to surmise where they're going to get to, you know? Yeah. Because I, I think it's literally just to, like, give you reminders of like, oh, remember the Morlocks? Okay. Here's why you need to remember the Morlocks. Yeah, and even like the the Dark Phoenix was like, <laughs> huh? They're gonna touch on that. They do and they don't. Right. Like it's it's, it's a little bit thing. of a throwaway line. Yeah. Yeah. So the actual episode opens up. They don't continue from a previous scene or anything. It just opens up cold on Coney Island. There's a Ferris wheel. We don't know what's wrong with it, but this is like the version of New York that no one wants to live in in real life because there's like a superhuman catastrophe every night you know, so. but this has nothing to do with a catastrophe this is literally just well that's falling over well i see i think even like in like gotham city or whatever even when the joker or one of the villains doesn't have anything to do with it something goes wrong that has to include batman you know it's like it's just like the unluckiest metropolitan areas <laughs> that i completely agree with <laughs> and R- random guys are making earthquakes happen that is yeah. going to have effect on foundations <laughs> if you do it enough right. like bayville in evolution is it just going to fall into the sea one day right and that's something that these guys would have done they would have addressed you know sooner it's like oh yeah the school we got lost at sea how it's like well you've been there lately yeah so the ferris wheel is basically breaking off its joint is that what's called the axis i guess axis is probably better term like the middle part i'm not an engineer spoke spoke there you go because that's the hub and spoke model so it's just sure sure. yeah Yeah. i don't know i don't don't ask us to engineer mechanical yeah (laughs) marketer and in musician that's not our specialty (laughs) yeah i can count to four so (laughs) the the thing is getting ready to fall off that thing and so the news reporter says they've saved everybody but one for some reason they evacuated everyone except for a small child I think other people were probably easier to get to. I mean, the kid, the kid kind of fucked up. Yeah. They remind us they're in the nineties because the kid has specifically the, the yellow waterproof Sony Walkman only (laughs) since like Sony's kind of like the anti-hero of Marvel right now, especially like the Madam web and like, and I'm not even saying because anti-hero movies, I'm saying like in the real world, Sony's kind of like in a weird relationship with Mark. I don't, I don't think you know what anti-hero means, Rod. I I'm trying to be nice about it. (laughs) Because like, like, it's the, so it's clearly that if you, if you live through the nineties, you know, it is the Sony Walkman, Walkman, but the logo is kind of like, it's not AI, but like they changed it just enough to read something gibberish that is vaguely in the same shape, but it drops to the ground and breaks to kind yeah. of show like this is, he's really far up like he will yeah. liquefy if he there there is up. one firefighter who is on the you know the ladder and, and it's not technically the ladder it's the whatever thing that they lift the firefighters up to to grab people and is that what she a hook is? 
Sure. I, only, I just watched uh, the new Ghostbusters, and I noticed in all the old fire stations it says hook and ladder, so I don't know if that's... Sure. <laughs> I don't know. We've been wrong about other shit <laughs> right? before. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go with yes. But she's like trying to help him out and that's when it starts to shake and that's when rod's favorite walkman in history falls right. and shatters to the ground and then the reporter is still reporting on all this stuff but then she like kind of does a thing i don't think we've seen in this show but we see in like 80s and 90s live action tv reporters where they look off camera and like what is that and we don't see it yet but we follow their eye line yeah she calls to her cameraman art who had a oh, name is that <laughs> yeah Watch that be like a mutant two or something. This is the show if there are going to be references, and there there are two very very subtle references that are in this show. I'll bring them up when we get to okay. it at this episode. That I was just like, that is a blink and you will miss it. Okay, so, I, I probably missed it, and I probably didn't even blink to miss it. It required reading, so I'm assuming okay. you didn't do it. Yeah, well, it's weird. It's weird. Like somehow I caught DeCosta in the background, but not right. Like other names, I don't know. But it's you weird. missed eat coffee, yeah. or maybe I saw it and I was like, that tracks as New York. Yeah. And he's like, can it be? No, it's it's Magneto. He's, you know, is and everyone is genuinely surprised that he's saving this child. Well, I guess he he is a known terrorist, so yeah. I guess we saw everything and we know that he has a complex like philosophy. But yeah, the public only knows him from like dropping cities and shit. And again, just remember what the level of internet access everybody had in 97 was. Yeah. <laughs> These stories were not getting shared appropriately. Let's be totally yeah. honest. And J. Jonah Jameson was the primary like print. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> and Magneto pretty like kind of uneventfully saves him. He basically just magnetizes the car or whatever and gently brings it down and, and saves him. And then he just kind of like fucks off without much fanfare. It's like more about the actually saving than the mm-hmm. demonstration, which also feels uncharacteristic of a Magneto. So check number one for my suspicion about this man right now. Fair. <laughs> it's like, you usually like to make a big scene of things. There's no, there was no monologue. <laughs> like there, or at least if there was a little bit of speech, there wasn't like the 20 minute monologue that gave us all a chance to get away at the time. And so then it segues to the mansion where Scott and Gene are watching that news report. Scott asked a question that probably everybody else was asking. like, he left this to that guy? Like, are we sure? And I think Gene even says something like, if you want to read it again, you know, so this implies that they've all reviewed the yeah. legal papers and stuff. And in- she's, she also is like, well, maybe he did it for us. Like he knew oh, some shit was going to go down. And I was like, that feels a little self-centered, Gene, that he right. would bring in the worst enemy as a way to help you. Like, yeah. I think it was more of, I, I, I interpret it as, this was more, he felt like he was starting to get through to Eric at some point, maybe around like beyond good and evil and stuff like that. And this is like, if I set you on the right path, then maybe this seals the deal, even if I couldn't do it during my life. So Jean says what you said, except in like the white Instagram mom way. She was like, maybe he had a plan. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm talking about a fictional yeah. character that I know is a fictional character. Yeah. And, and Scott, I, we didn't see a reaction from Scott that I remember, but I just want to believe that it, behind his visor, he was like rolling his eyes into the back of his throat. That, that's, that he, that's the benefit of wearing the visor is you don't have to like, people can't read your eyes when right. that's happening. Yeah, he can actually control his optic blast. He just chooses. To- Except that he's married to a telepath and she knows exactly what that's he's true. thinking. That's true. And then we see this is kind of like a montage of things. So they go to some sort of war room, I guess, at the UN, where Dr. Cooper is watching with the military. Felt like very, like, war room you'd see out of, like, you know, Hunt for Red October type vibes. Oh, yeah, almost like a bunker, maybe. Like yeah. A, like a apocalypse. Like, it's definitely an underground spot. Yeah. Yeah. And then it segues to, I still don't know his name, but the guy that's the executioner. Our, He's our not- guy that up until this point has been the lead of the Friends of Humanity group with the three claw slashes who, mm-hmm. yeah, let's just, to make our lives easier, executioner, executioner for the episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And is it executioner? I've heard people say executioner, but I thought that that was just stylized to the way it was looked. I think that's stylized. And it's supposed to be executioner. Yeah. Right. Okay. So executioner. That's so much easier to say. <laughs> We're not going to say executioner. Okay. I mean, yeah. No. He's not really watching it. It's on a TV in the background, and he's working on like a weapon that, like, basically the laser blaster kind of thing from the '92 series. But he's got it connected to one of the Genosha callers, and I even I knew what was happening then. I still wasn't prepared for who it was going to be because I knew it couldn't be Magneto because he's too central. Everything's happening right now. But I was like, are they really? Because And it's fun that they use like this kind of like 90s logic for it. 
of they can only hold one charge and it literally has a digital display of this only has one charge and it's also as simple as connecting the thing to the with the, the collar yeah. to the gun and no one in history has thought of that before i also <laughs> love the whole idea that this is like you know we we get a little bit of uh interpretation of it later that it was low level radiation that was oh, being yeah. so that meant they were putting low level radiation collars and carrying them around on genosha in those early episodes friends of humanity right <laughs> uh, that wasn't even friends of humanity that was just a straight oh, up right. genosian government <laughs> But these guys are just like carrying them like their duffel or no rollerblade uh, rollerblade no, boxes. boxes. Yeah. yeah. And then in the sewers, we see that another faction or I guess everybody but ex- the executioner in the Friends of Humanity are capturing Callisto, Leech, and I forgot the name of the two others. Ape. Ape. That's right. And and then the other one with the eye patch is Erg. I don't. And, know I, Erg. and I I will fully admit I had to look up Erg's name because I could <laughs> not remember it. I did remember Ape, though, because Ape was the one who became the table that yeah. Wolverine saved Leech on. That's right. In the Christmas episode. <laughs> exactly. And God, it's so bad. I love it. I love I love how bad that episode is. I mean, I, I still I like Christmas episodes. I thought that was fun. If, like, you know, if for some reason you haven't caught up on all the 92 stuff we did all the 92 episodes and the christmas episodes no exception and I, if I you if you haven't rod has posted a very angry meme at people like you was oh, oh the one i just made <laughs> i just want to say like it it's just funny because i can't fault anybody for binging the last two weeks to prepare for 97 i just wanted to be known that we've been doing this for like over two years <laughs> so it's not a new thing so also in this scene not that i have any special like protectiveness over leech but remembering how he was in the christmas episode and then how he's begging for his life in this one is like we just need to protect leech because we have to remember he's like a child he's literally a child <laughs> yeah and he's super innocent like i i don't even know talks about himself in the third person right <laughs> and he's lived his life in the sewers he does have eyes now though yeah, well, all of them do. Like that's the storm has pupils. Like, right? Yeah, like he he used to just be like the fully like everything was yellow, and they at least yeah. have eyes on him now. So, and so like Callisto's like, listen, our whole mo is that we don't want to bother anybody, so we don't bother. That's why we're literally living in shit. And the friends of humanity are like, do you think like we could feel safe knowing that you're like living underneath us? And this is just more of that bigoted theology of course you just can't exist even if you're minding your own business and magneto busts in and saves them you know because it's just all the mag the all the metal things start glowing and start moving i love how no fucks this magneto is like he was a lot more graceful 92 in the sense of like it was more theatrical this one he's like slams that chick against the wall and then she starts trying to mouth him and he just like slams the metal plate against her mouth like these people have fractures <laughs> oh and there there's one where it's like the thing that you would turn to like shut down a pipe and uh-huh. it literally hits the dude across the jaw oh yeah like no, that I, dude does not have a jaw anymore i, say, I thought he got decapitated like <laughs> well, no because in the scene that comes up in a second it's addressed of like no no they're still alive so it yeah. can't be decapitation no but will he say they were like he said something like incapacitated or whatever but like like well he's like harmed but not a yeah harmed right. but not dead i was like okay yeah so, like, he also has like a crazy line where it was like you don't you won't even give them the indignity of being in your waist it's like yeah oh here's the thing man the fucking writing for magneto is a different level right now with some of the speeches he gives in this episode like I this mean, is the magneto episode he's he's great like he yeah it is really great writing i was super impressed with like storms everything but yep. i have to admit like magneto's is like you said on another level also because of how real it is even though this one doesn't specifically tap into like a it does tap into a real life thing but it could also just be easily about this cartoon he yeah. as this episode goes along that we'll talk about he just calls out like real life stuff the, yep. it, so he also like introduces himself to leech and leech is like oh my god it's you you're real and magneto does the this is never going to happen to you guys again i won't let it happen to you again that's right right and it, it it we see this over and over again but magneto even if he doesn't necessarily like care for someone any mutant is over the best human in his priorities list so like he's he's out there protect i mean to the point where like we don't know how he figured out that this was happening like if it was tracked or if he was like keeping an eye on the sewers from morlocks but like either way he's helping out a group of mutants that like are just generally overlooked yeah they're 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 the bottom of the food chain even within 
the mutant being the bottom of the food chain. And back at the mansion, at the X-Men are talking about Xavier and Magneto and like what what was he thinking like what are the <laughs> yeah there's <laughs> some cool there's some cool parts to it because Beast is like well the best way to you know get rid of your enemy is to make him your friend and he basically did a uh, Mark Twain quote for that one Bishop is like I've seen a bunch of different futures I've never seen this one I like that one because like he's he acknowledges that yeah he's been doing a lot of traveling and so what what does that mean then to like i guess it's possible you know he doesn't visit every millions of possibilities but well he has- also bishops is not traveling the multiverse this is just mm-hmm. bishop going into a timeline seeing a change and then seeing like kind of only the cause and effect but he's not like jumping between universes like multiverse of madness kind of scenario yeah i think because he even didn't he even acknowledge that he's seen futures where xavier dies but you know to punctuate it like never one where magneto has yeah because he he literally lived through them right 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 yeah, yeah. i mean like, that was literally why Those his episodes. his future existed in the first episode like his days of future past yeah so that's yeah it's just a more but yeah it was a great it was a great little line from him that was a uh, not a big thing but like a good attention to detail rogue actually comes to the defense of magneto though she's like there's some of us who've been so dirty in the past, but like we all got a shot. And I think this is one of those things that it was like it was there, but watching it the second time, knowing what you know is going to yeah. happen in the episode, it stood out so much more. Like, yeah, it's true. And, but it, she's right too, though. Like most of them, except for like the original team and Storm. yeah, aside from Scott, Gene, and I mean Storm was a oh, she was, was a, a thief. Pocket. That's true. She was a yeah. thief. Yeah, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, everybody has a Gambit, especially. I mean, li- literally <laughs> Thieves Guild. Yeah, yeah. As- aside from the original five, basically. Yeah. So she has a point. Granted, they none of the rest of them probably went on like global terrorist level of things, but. I would hope not. <laughs> but they also didn't have a history with Xavier before. In a history of global like, terrorism. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and Magneto arrives just in time to interrupt the conversation, but not to overhear what they were talking about, or at least that we know of. Yeah. They were talking about him. And he, I love that he's the reality in this one, because he kind of casually says, like, yes, I'm moving the Morlocks to Genosha. I'm just surprised all of you or Xavier didn't think to do this with all his vast amounts of money. I was like, dude, it, it was the, <laughs> it was the best shade that he ever could have tossed at them because it's like, oh yeah, you have this mega mansion with multiple jets that you keep rebuilding and setting up, you know, private runways underground for. Yeah, you didn't think to set aside a few bucks to get people like out of the sewers of New York City. Yeah, and at least in our knowledge. There's not more Morlocks than the the group that we saw. So there was, to their knowledge, there's a finite set of the Morlocks. So it wasn't like there was like this unending amount of yeah, it's sewer the, dwellers. It's the Christmas group. The, yeah. the, when you, when you saw the most Morlocks in during Christmas, all you did was bring them a dinner. You know, it gives me the energy. Do you remember how Home Alone Two ended? It's been a minute, but so remember through the movie. Kevin. The pigeon lady yeah so yeah. at the end when his family like gets to have that big dinner together he like takes her i think it was i forget what it was it doesn't matter he either takes her some food or like those little dove things but as a kid i was like oh that's sweet or whatever i watched it as an adult i think like two christmases ago i was like you're like give her invite, fucking food you asshole invite like, her to her- dinner like she's outside in new york like in central Freezing. park Literally freezing during December. Ask her into because he, he just ordered like what six thousand dollars worth of room service for himself. So this is kind yeah. of that energy that Magneto was like, yeah, you guys had this guy's wealth and never thought to help anybody but yourselves yeah. <laughs> financially. Yeah. Although there isn't there isn't anything more American than not d- <laughs> not l- helping people during the holidays. <laughs> well, how do I put this? I talk to people who are outside of America about this. Like one of the most American things to do is to come in and swoop in for the save at the end but never right. do anything to sustain people during then you're like w- there's not very much in the american healthcare system to keep people healthy but they want to like help save you from cancer after the fact right we'll help you we'll help you cure the cancer but we're not going to help you prevent the cancer yeah or, yeah or other things even like you know like destroying your body you know during manual labor or something or whatever yeah. like there's a lot of things so magneto throws that that shade and i love how in his very eloquent speech he like physically struggles to say coexistence yes <laughs> it's almost a, it's, it actually hurt him to say it out loud i almost got the feeling that he th- vomited in his mouth a little bit to say this is the way he said it. he was like 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, think about it. Like, his whole MO was like, uh, yeah, homo superior, and we're going to end this human issue. Yeah, and then Scott's like, Gene, read his mind to make sure he's being honest. And I'm, this, once again, this is something that we just would have been skipped in pre, in, you know, other older cartoons and stuff. But Gene makes a good point. She's like, even if I, because his point was like, you did this with Gyrick. And she was like, well, I was looking for information from him. For feelings, his mind could feel this way genuinely this moment. But we don't know if he'll wake up tomorrow morning and feel completely differently. And then Scott's like, then you're going to check all the time forever. I was like, did you just tell your wife to live in another man's head 24-7? Not (laughs) 24-7, but it was like at least once an hour every hour. That's still a lot. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just, I'm a semantics guy. And also, this is another one of those, like, okay, there's a reminder that there's still Scott from 92 in there because he told his very pregnant wife who's already dealing with literally everything else yeah. <laughs> to take on another task. Yeah. They're basically like, all right, well, fuck it. We're not leaving. Yeah. So they, they cancel their plans to, to leave. Yeah. Um, Magneto- and Storm, Storm has a great one where she was like, you know, you have been our biggest enemy yeah. for forever. So, yeah, we kind of, it's only natural for us to want a little bit of proof that you're legit. Yeah, and then Magneto says, like, of course, you're like, basically says she's the best one there, so she'll, he'll he'll do it for her, you know, like, he's what he owes her. I but, mean, go, goes as far as saying you are the closest thing we will have to a goddess. Yeah, and that was my note here was he compliments Storm too much. Okay. This is strike number two of my suspicion. Okay. <laughs> Because he doesn't do that to anybody else. Granted, she has proven to be the most badass so far. She is actually the one who's closest to being yeah. a god. And in this timeline, the only time we have heard Omega level so far. Which, once again, I want to remind everybody, I said that, was, that was a sexual experience for me in this episode. <laughs> and so, yeah, he he's just really nice to her. He gives that smirk. And I don't know, that, that was just... There is the quick comment of like, yeah, you know, maybe Xavier was wrong. And oh, that's right. it was like, oh, so after everything that's happened, this is what it takes for you to realize that Charles wasn't perfect. Yeah, that even he can make a mistake. Yeah. And then they cut away to Jean. I guess she's packing. I, I, I'm yep. not completely sure what's going on. Because they said they weren't going to leave. And then... Yeah, and it might have just been a little more of like the maybe we're leaving, maybe we're not leaving kind of mm-hmm. thing. And it's like, you kind of have to trust the process. Oh. You know what I bet she was doing? I just thought of this. She was probably packing her overnight bag when she goes into labor. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah I, I just that makes that sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been around friends that had kids, but I remember that era of my life where everyone's like wives uh, or my friends that were pregnant themselves were like, when they got that far in, like eight months to pack that hospital bag, so they could just go, I'll bet that's what she was doing. That that makes sense about what she talks about at that point. Right, I'm right. putting this together in real time. You're hearing my thought process in like real time. Storms. And then do you also see the photo. I love yeah. you, you. You spot the photo from a fucking mile away. And it's interesting because it's updated. Scott looks pretty much the same, but Jean is clearly updated. I know all of it's updated, but like... You mean like her hair and stuff? Style. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. the same photo. Exactly. It's definitely the same photo from the memes and stuff. Yeah. Also... Either multiple copies or they repaired it. Probably multiple copies. But Well, no, it was her own copy. It wasn't Wolverine's copy. Did Wolverine had a copy? I, I just assumed he stole hers. No, he definitely had his own copy. That was <laughs> definitely his own. What, 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 what world, even with these fucking magical beings with powers, is somebody able to like use mend like it's D&D to put a photo right. back together? <laughs> Storm's in there helping her. Jean and- is, pulls out the Marvel Girl dress, which... And the comics was her second outfit, but in this show, it was like, yeah, I haven't wore this since the time we were on the blue area of the moon. Yeah. And so it's, it's, back it's to... like, yeah, th- and I think that's why, like, the intro, they're like, yep, we're going to put a Dark Phoenix reference in here. Here's your Dark Phoenix reference. Oh, see, I thought the Dark Phoenix reference was for later, but this is a good one, too, mm-hmm. The, the that air, that storyline. So the Gene kind of she she makes storm promise that she won't tell anyone not even scott but also she won't judge her right what she's about to say and you just thought she was just gonna go on a horrible bigoted rant in <laughs> that'd be great she's like i actually don't like <laughs> yeah. anything you say there right. is problematic yeah. and you want to stop that sentence yeah, no. i stopped it purposely because you can fill in the blank with whatever you think it is so then she she's like i think about the world my child is going to be my son she so she says son is going to be yep. born in and then Storm picks up what she's putting down. She's like, 
you hope that your baby is human. It's, right. Because she's saying, like, you know, I don't want to have to tell them that every day of their life there are going to be people that are going to, like, hate them and, and trying to take them down. Yeah, it won't be safe just to live life. Sounds familiar to real world scenarios. Storm kind of confides in her too. It's like, listen, I can't say that I haven't daydreamed about that as well. And dude, again, talking about having watched the episode twice, this scene starts hitting way fucking earlier. And Storm, and yeah, specifically, Storm says, but that led me to us being sisters. Yeah, it brought me to this mansion, this being my family, and you being my sister. This connection they have. Yeah. Tell me, tell me though, what you thought. Like, I felt like, to an extent, they seem tighter in this show than they were in, in 92. Oh, 100%. Okay. I don't know if I'm forgetting any scenes before, but I don't feel like I got this bond at all in 92. I always got the impression she was closer to Rogue than she was to Jean. Maybe, yeah. I... I Actually, I didn't see Storm super close to anyone besides like Wolverine in an alternate timeline and the one time they went in the picnic in this timeline or alternate future, I guess. But alternate present. 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 That's right. Yeah. Remember, it was um, the alternate present. I knew. I was like, I know I'm, I always get that one wrong, whatever that is. But then, and, you know, they, it's, and Storm reassures her that it's not wrong to like try to be a good mother. And they, they have a pretty sentimental moment. It's also, I've heard a couple other people comment on this online that, this is interesting now because we're in this era of Marvel where every mother is like pretty psychotic, like Wanda. Well, you know. Wanda, yeah. There was somebody else too. All the other ones just die. Right. And this is an example of like a mom who's like, even though the decision isn't quite right, she's coming from a pure place with it. Like, right. she's like, I just, I don't want this child to have to deal with the shit that I've dealt with, you know? Yeah. And then on top of all that, Jean's like, I just have this i can't shake this feeling that something horrible is coming and this is a little more insight to her premonition where it's not future telling in like the fortune telling sort of way it's not it's not like destiny yeah yeah it's there's this like she had this vague like feeling yeah that whatever this like impending doom i guess she had also just gone into gyrick's mind of like there's some <laughs> big shit in our plans even if she couldn't interpret it so right then back in xavier's office rogue's talking to magneto and I know you're ready for this question. Did they have an affair before? So some other yes. friends have told me that in yes. the comics they have, but in this show, like they it never, is, it is implied that it happened yeah. before. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out where in the timeline that happened. <laughs> pre pre joining. Oh, okay. Before joining. So in the comics, it happens in the Savage Land. Here, I think this was probably when she was an adult. Mystique that's a, that's a, that's was a big, was. That's a big important part to remember because of their age difference. But I do think it was probably around the time that she was running with Mystique, like pre getting Carol Danvers powers. Okay. I guess that would kind of track because like Mystique and her circle or yeah. whatever. But man, that caught me totally off guard. I was like, I'm just I'm just reading into this because I'm me and we know my history of scenes right. in the show. And I and I and think there's was there was a storytelling <laughs> concession that they had to have it ha happen in the past rather than let it naturally develop over time like it did in the comics because you couldn't just like what they're doing at like the rapid pace of the season with certain storylines. I don't think people would have believed like he joined and all of a sudden they're in love again, like kind of yeah. thing. Like, I think it was a, oh, there was a thing in the past that we just have to acknowledge happened for a portion of time. Yeah. And then this is a callback that you mentioned for when she was kind of defending him previously. Yep. And I do think it's interesting that she's the one that's really adamant about not telling anybody. Yeah. Because they're having this like cool con or like not cool necessarily, but this conversation <laughs> around like, oh, they don't trust me yet, but I kind of get why. Would they trust you if they knew? And she's like, well, we don't need to revisit it because it's never going to happen again. Also a strong choice, to your point, of living in a house of telepaths. <laughs> a lot of restraint there. I, I Gambit thinks all the filthy thoughts that it just, like, it's white right. noise for everybody else's. <laughs> like, la, la, la. Gene literally uh, walks around the mansion going la, la, la the entire <laughs> right. time. And, and then they get interrupted because helicopters arrive. Yep. And they're... It's funny because... All the X-Men go outside. Magneto's his no segue. He's fully taking this place as the leader. He's like, all right, let's prepare. And Cyclops is like, we don't get scared when the good guys come. And then right on cue, the military comes out with guns blazing. Not blazing, but like pointed. Pointed, absolutely. And, and Magneto's like, and you were saying? So, so real quick, 
like we we've alluded to it in the past, but now that you've seen it in action, what do you think of the outfit? Because <laughs> Magneto's. Yeah, because I'm genuinely curious because it's like it's also now it's in the full context of, oh, yeah, he's literally leading the team being a good guy. Uh-huh. So he can't wear the old uniform when it's like, oh, yeah, here, terrorists, 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 right. like being shoved in your face. Oh, you know? I, didn't, I guess that makes sense about why the costume change. I'm personally not a big fan of the design, but it's also not like a big detractor to me. Like right. there's nothing actually wrong. with. I think it's just a personal preference thing. I do think it's like such a statement, though. That he's giving like like your uncle that was in like theater camp, you know, because he's either wearing we, like we have very different uncles. Well, he's like because he's super eccentric, everything Shakespearean, yeah, and he, and he's not Storm, and he's like he has like spandex, like a spandex bodysuit with his uh, the monogram on it of his first initial, and then like or no his second initial I guess his last name, yeah, and then like gloves that either gloves that go all the way beyond the elbow, or a suit that is missing the shoulders. I think it's is, the gloves. Yeah, I think it's the gloves too, but either way like it's a it's a statement. Like the also, whole Also, <laughs> shout out to our friends Max No Sleeves who hates the outfit purely because it is the opposite of no sleeves. Right. It's it's like it's it's sleeves. <laughs> it's sleeves just in the other areas. It's like the it's sleeves it's, but if they were like socks basically. And it's kind of like what I was describing with Storm is like they didn't fuck her up. Kinda. Like they kinda did both. Uh, right. And and then his cape is kind of like a scarf cloak thing. It's not a Superman cape. Yeah. Like it's, everything's dramatic. Like everything has like it, movement. It, it has it, a little bit of like a messiah complex around it too. I could see that like a yeah. But also like how old is he now? Like ninety something? Well, no, because he was, no, oh, he was a kid in the 90s. It's, his, it's still in the 90s, and yeah. we determined he would have World War II, so he's probably six. Good for him for being in that shape. Probably 60. Because he's not just He's fine. also fucking shredded. Yeah, like, he has, like, Dwayne Johnson upper body proportions. <laughs> like, yeah. that's insane. Well, also, we didn't mention in the last episode, but Cyclops, too. Like, dude is built like his Marvel versus Capcom character design <laughs> right. with, like, there are, there are muscles that I can't name that are popping out of, like, underneath his pecs. My, so. It's funny, when the stills came out of all the characters, my brother was, like, worried. He was like, oh, they don't feel like... When he said not as good as the original, he was like, not the actual, like, quality. He was like, I just... I like the over-muscular original x-men and well, then just, welcome to this fucking episode <laughs> right yeah then we he you know he watched he binged these two episodes like i did and he was like not worried about it anymore <laughs> yeah <laughs> like everybody's super muscular but then dr cooper comes out of the choppers and like clarifies we're here for magneto i like that she kind of like motions to like lower the guns for like a hot second yeah. too and it's like yep we're here for him the u.n commission for superhuman activities specifically not it wasn't just mutants yeah so foreshadowing of more people we're going to see i mean i kind of like that because like it was human mutant relations was her focus in the comic so i kind of like this being like oh no this is like if we ever need to pull the sokovia accord story oh. we can do that because it's it's an international entity already yeah that's interesting not as, not as quite of a sexy as of a acronym but you know yeah <laughs> they're like yeah you know we have our our guns that you can't really mess with he's like yeah but what about this and he picks up the helicopters and he basically like surrounds the soldiers on the ground with the helicopter blades for a hot second he turns the lawn into like a food processor yeah like i love it but also yeah. they they did it complete they didn't show us by kind of I want somebody to make a TikTok of this, of like what the pilots were doing, because they didn't show them, but you're like, they're, you can even imagine they're like, ah! Or just screaming uncontrollably. That's what I mean, yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. like, what is going on? Because yeah. they probably can't hear, and they're like, what's what's happening out there? And then all of a right. sudden... Right, and they're, then they're like, I didn't tell the helicopter to do this. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, let's say I do this, and I get found, you know, acquitted for any of these crimes. Are you going to... Is that going to earn your trust? And she's like, yeah, that's what due process is. And he goes, I yield. And it was like... yeah. That was that was strong. Yeah, that was cool. And then he puts his hands out to be cuffed, and they cuffed him. I love that. They're just going through the motions because none and, of that shit matters. With no, but they did put the 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 neck the collar, collar on him. Yeah, but they put the cuffs on first, and I was like, like that didn't matter. Yeah, but then there is a quick like eye to eye with him and Rogue. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I think, but I think that's him like showing Rogue like, hey, I'm doing this so I can be trusted. Be but trust, and yeah. even if it's not by the humans, it's at least for the team. Maybe I guess they they keep they keep implying that he's regaining his feelings for her. So it's on one level, 
to gain the trust of the team and humanity and then another level like get this girl back like there's a little bit of a spark that's still definitely there from from the room and then you literally have the trial of magneto which was x-men issue 200 i only know this because of when his outfit got revealed the the cover, the cover. That got shown everywhere and they recreated it like 100 percent. yeah and dr cooper is listing basically everything magneto did in 92 <laughs> she's just going through the laundry list like oh yeah. remember the time that he tried to steal nukes from the u.s government that's yeah. all i should have to say but i have more yeah asteroid m like wolverine and gene are watching from home and wolverine's like man she's going through everything and gene's like have you seen size Cy- <laughs> yeah have you seen cyclops he's like he's there there she's like oh he didn't tell me and then wolverine's like well, a lot of that going around lately he's like man there's shade going around this whole house everybody's pissy with each other right now <laughs> it was because there's like 20 love triangles going on in this house <laughs> yeah and then this episode has what could be considered the two first like bad words dropped in the show and I use bad words because it's not actually a curse, yeah. but like Wolverine mentions that folks are pissed about the trial that's true. and pissed. I was like, okay, that's a word we wouldn't have heard in, in 92. And Wolverine like kind of agrees that Magneto shouldn't have gotten a trial, which is funny because he was literally used as a weapon of war and probably should stand trial for the things he did for the weapon X program. And then back at the trial, my note here says angry Facebook commenters are picketing outside as the executioner loads his gun. <laughs> yeah. In, uh, in, you, in, you, in the, the child abduction van. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the candy van. Also, if you know, you know, the commenters, what this is, I saw this coming from a mile away. As soon as they show the protesters outside the, U, the UN, I'm like, they he put the, they put that story in here. They put this story in here. <laughs> like, it's the, the, like, this story is still warm. Like, it's not even old. It it has not been resolved. That's yeah. how warm the damn thing well, but is. Yeah, yeah. So then Magneto, this speech it could be framed, right? Right. Like, it's so good. And I, I had here, it's a hard speech. And almost by every connotation, it's harsh. It's true. Like, yep. it's, not, it's not pulling any punches. And he says all, and you probably have the speech there, but he... He says all the things that people always argue like, well, they didn't outright say that in 92. And he says it here. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he the, the, the part that hit the strongest for me was his people saw their homes get burned down by another group. And then later, his people, meaning the mutant side of stuff, were then seeing themselves being driven out by the people who they had previously stood beside. Yeah. And, because and those they, people and, turned and they jumped to the other side of 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 the scenario. He said the oppressed became the oppressors. Yeah, and and also his line. Yeah, you know, I grew up in like a Protestant church. He said we were hated simply for calling God by a different name, and I was like, that was the most eloquent way. I'm saving that to talk about in real life. Yeah, <laughs> because just a, like a minor tangent, and we haven't been on one in a while. I, I was watching the making of the Echo series, and I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, the I did not watch the making of, but I did watch so all of Echo. I I didn't. I it, this doesn't surprise me, but I didn't know until I saw the making of that when they had the powwow. It was minor spoiler for Echo, but they had a powwow at the end of the show. Marvel production figured out that when they started doing all the consulting and budgeting, they were like, "We should just throw a powwow," and that and the Choctaw Nation like put it on. The only thing mm-hmm. they had to do was move it to Atlanta. But see, they said all the B roll you see, they they filmed the shots they needed, but all the B roll you see was everyone genuinely having the powwow. That's awesome. And in the making of, I was watching and I was like, "This, if you didn't tell me anything about this, this is almost exactly one to one of like the church services I grew up in." Mm-hmm. Yet the churches I grew up in would condemn this ceremony by these people. Right. I was like, so this line of him, like calling God by a different name, like, yeah, that's the only difference that mattered to that. It was like, wow. It's like, so whoever, whatever it, people's people wrote, this person wrote the speech, like, and then he says those who love differently mm-hmm. for, for sex, who believe differently. He just laid it all out there. Yeah. Like they, they said it. There was no like, we, you know, I was in a, Polish encampment you know, with yeah. the plus sign people. <laughs> and just for reference, Rod calls the Nazis the plus sign people because of the use of imagery to not showcase the swastika in the old <laughs> soldiers episode. Only mentioning that for context because <laughs> we do not want to diminish the horrible shit of the Nazis. 
But there oh, yeah. are certain inside jokes that we have from previous episodes. So just dropping that for clarity. Yeah, so. this show is more of a it's more of like a poking fun at like the the censorship that had to happen in '92. Exactly. Stuff because even they they even just say it, it was a Polish camp, I think, right? Or I, I mean, it, I it was something super vague. It was like a yeah yeah a refugee camp somewhere. Oh they, yeah, it was literally a refugee camp as opposed to being a concentration camp. So yeah, yeah. and at the uh, time, the X Men are standing there watch or or sorry are sitting there watching i love that beast shows up just in his underwear and his like <laughs> shiar backpack like he has no clothes that he is worn to like yeah, stuff like coat? yeah <laughs> like he's like he's literally like spoken at congress like he's worn nicer stuff than his underwear yeah this one he's like fuck these people yeah <laughs> and then one another thing i love that magneto said was he called out the judges for their soundbite indignation and- oh yeah there's multiple instances of this, but the one that comes to mind most recently for me is when, not this recent time, but the time before TikTok had to stand before, was it Congress? I yes. Think? And they were asking the dumbest questions. Like, they were so dumb, they had to have been purposely planned to get sound bites. Like, does, does TikTok use Wi Fi? Yeah, does it have access to my Wi Fi? Yes. That's how it connects to the internet. Like, what the fuck question is that? Yeah. At the time, we're also getting interspersed shots with, like, the Morlocks are are traveling and they're watching on like a like a hand tv set they also did swap out tommy was in there instead of ape yeah i saw i recognized tommy because the colorful yep. hair the strangely like normal name yes the the name that does not align with the power set magneto is like you know xavier trusted me with this and it's, you know it's a demand for change and this is where the healing begins and then the, from the tribunal, the guy who I refer to as Texas, because none of them have a name, but he has oh, a yeah. very heavy southern accent. He is basically like calling, trying to call bullshit on Magneto. And that's where, you know, your point of like your sound bites are not what is going to make this work. So he then starts like showcasing like verbally and you get like imagery in the background of the stuff humans have done to mutants, like creation of the Sentinels, like the Genosian collars and all that kind of stuff. This and another get out parallel won't go into because we've done it 20 times on the show. <laughs> yeah. But then that's where the the woman on the tribunal that is not Val, there's like three people of the tribunal. Yeah. And then Val, I guess, is essentially the, the prosecutor of this. Yeah. They're like, well, oh, sorry. It wasn't the woman. I think it was the, the, the one who had the Russian ish accent is like, oh, no, this is protection. And he's like, ah, it doesn't really feel like protection. It feels like extermination to me. And then the woman on the end says, like, then what is, what are we to believe? Like, what you see as extermination, how do we know that you're not going to retaliate from that? And I was like, this uh, this conversation could go on forever if that's your logic. It was just like, well, if you're going to do that, then what's to say you're not going to do this? And then my note here says, then January 6th happens. The only thing that happened before the insurrection was uh, you do see a shot of sad rogue, but literally yeah. everything else, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, Almost like they just took news footage and traced over it. Like, it's hard to mistake what's happening in there. It also, I, it became like a huge conversation. Because I, I was like, people talk about this on TikTok. I opened up TikTok and two scrolls away. I was like, the X-Men fought January 6th. <laughs> it's hard to describe any other way. It just, because it wasn't just like, because we've seen insurrections in other movies, in media and stuff, you know, like, like just general, like overtaking governments and stuff. There was, there's a specific look to what we saw in real life a couple of years ago that is recreated in this just in the actions and the look of the characters and stuff yeah it, it's just wild and then it, down to like the the politicians yeah like, needing to be protected right because <laughs> it's the 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 security pops into the room and he's like they're here for magneto and the the tribunal and the dude is like wait what did we do and magneto is like yeah well you gave a monster a trial so you know, now you're getting treated like one. Yeah, I love he said, ah, to play by the rules and still face the consequences. Yep. I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So Scott takes charge, basically is like, Storm, you stay inside and you pr- you protect the, the group and Magneto. We're all going to go out to the lobby. And that's where it jumps over. Wolverine is like getting ready to go to the city. And I because the scene. fight's breaking out. And then Gene comes out and goes, he's here. 
and Wolverine throws the jacket and he's like, who's here? Apocalypse? And then claws out like. claws out ready to go <laughs> and then like god the 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 cinematography and i wish i knew what if there's a different phrasing for it for animation that we should yeah. ask somebody by the time yeah. we do the next recording but literally the jacket comes back yeah. in and it's like you know he's. he's coming it's like my son and he's like oh crap and then the keys pop into frame and land in his hand it's so good it's like the baby's coming you dumbass yeah the two things i I, love that it was apocalypse (laughs) yeah because it's like why would he suddenly be here i guess he does just kind of randomly show up a lot but the two like kind of funny things i loved about this was how he was like one tick away from being like looney tunes when he's like he he, like claws out you know he's like oh an apocalypse like it was just so like sudden and almost comical not quite but like it was was super super fun i also love that that they gave these two this moment Yes. Of course it had to be these two. Yep. (laughs) Of course Wolverine has to deliver Gene's baby by a different man. (laughs) Yeah. So they get in the the Jeep and they start driving. And here is where it was blink and you'll miss it. Okay. Two great references here. They drive down the street and one of the spots is Ween's Cafe. Oh. As in Len Ween, who is the creator of Wolverine. And then there was Romita's Saloon, which is likely a reference to John Romita Jr., who did a bunch of X-Men work. But John Romita Sr. was also a massive part of the Marvel catalog and stuff like that. So that's cool. I love here, we kind of get, I referenced a few episodes back about when Charles in Logan, when he has like seizures or whatever he had and it starts killing people or whatever. We kind of get that version with Gene. Mm Because as she's having contractions, the hood of the the Jeep or the car like just like blows off. Well, she Logan is driving on the sidewalk because yeah. of a traffic jam mm-hmm. and he's going to mow people down with this Jeep if Gene had not moved them. Yeah, including a puppy. <laughs> yeah. A dog a guy walking his dog, the dog, and then a guy who's like like who's eating ice cream or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then they, they like get saved and then Gene has the contraction and just rips like it was kind of a sweet revenge for Wolverine giving Cyclops the convertible like oh, all those years true. ago. I didn't think about that. Yeah. We never, it fades away before we see where that piece of metal lands. It went through the dog. Right. It lands on them anyway. <laughs> like, literally, it, it went that perfect angle that it hit the guy, the dog, and that guy who was eating the yeah. ice cream. So then we catch up to the X Men holding off the true patriots at the UN. And that's where I literally wrote January 6 vibes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which, ironically, Scott builds a wall, but. I do love, like, and I saw a comment, so a friend of the show, Joe Malone, was talking about this. Like, Cyclops using his power in such cool and creative ways that, like, he actually feels fucking cool. Like, literally making a wall out of the, the ground in front of the UN, you know? And also, you know, I've already said this a dozen times, but him using his powers more accurately to how you've always described it to me. The push, so not, yeah. Yeah, the push and not the laser, because... Mm-hmm. I'm so used to the laser, for lack of better words, like burned into my mind, you know, that like when he because they didn't they didn't it wasn't a full shot. It was just him when the when the optic blast came out. So I was like, did he just Homelander all those people? You know, he's just my gut reaction. <laughs> but then you see it like hit the ground. You're like, oh, that's right. It's yeah. just, he's like punching the ground with his eyes, basically. I hate that you said burned into your I know, mind. I couldn't think of it. Yeah, I know. I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> but that's where we get the full formal introduction of the executioner who blows a hole through the wall. So like he's working with a different level of weapon compared to like there was one like jacked bigot dude who was like just shoulder checking the wall like yeah that's gonna do something you dumbass and i had here so executioner gives this although it's wrong powerful kind of mini speech to scott before he gets to before he gets to scott he mentions that he has this like energy resilient armor so he's getting shot by bishop and it's kind of not doing anything they get into it real quick and he actually is able to drop a collar onto bishop's next and then kicks him out through the door like into the yeah. mob of protesters and then like throughout the fight like he actually gets a hold of gambit's bow staff and cracks scott right across the face in the visor with it yeah it's he's he's also trained so of the idiots he's the least of the idiots he's he's the most proficient idiot right yeah and then I scott's thought, bleeding I, from the face as this is all going right. down that's why we haven't seen blood since Magneto's stomach, right? There were definitely like one or two punches in the previous episode that there was blood coming from their oh, faces. Okay. It was it was quicker, but it was definitely there. Yeah, but this one it was coming out of his mouth, right? 
Yeah, I mean, it was like down his face. So, yeah. And I thought that he shattered his visor. I was like, are we going to get another like closed eye fight? <laughs> yeah, because he's like, yeah, he's essentially just going for it right now. Yeah. And then Executioner gets real close to Scott. He does what Agent Smith kind of did to Morpheus in the Matrix. Which yeah. Is real close. And, and, says, and the speech actually mirrors a little bit of Morpheus's like tone, too. Oh, I could see that, too. Yeah. yeah. And, but my note here is like Executioner kind of gives Scott an All Lives Matter speech. He's like, you have no idea how it feels to like, like who it's, cares? Man? He's like, like, it's the whining. I can't take yeah. the whining. It's like, go fuck yourself. Like, right. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, well, at least they're establishing him as like, there's not a single drop of good in this person. Yeah. He's full fledged um, trash. But then he gets saved by Lady Deathstrike. It took half a second, but you know, you realize ah, morph. It, if it makes you feel any better that it took you half a second, there were definitely people online who were like, I don't believe Lady Deathstrike was fighting on the side of the X-Men. And they missed the nuance of this entire scene, dude. Like, really I don't bad. know if this is people who are, like, watching on their phone and, like, literally looking down more than they're yeah. looking up kind of thing. But I was like, they're like, yeah, and then, like, when did Colossus come back on the team? It's like, you, you, you've got to be trolling because you're all you're doing is pissing me off right now. That's like I had posted how excited I was to make a bowl of cereal and watch X-Men 97. And X Men ninety seven was behind my bowl of cereal, and then someone, one of my friends, who, if you're listening to this, I love you. I just think it's funny, so I'm sharing the story. Yep. They're like, "Have you seen X Men 97? I was like, "Yeah, I even made a bowl of cereal and took a picture of it in front of the TV." It's literally broadcast, so I don't know nuance. You know, yep. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't even know if I would call that nuance, but yep. <laughs> oh yeah, Colossus and Psylocke. Yeah, and then at that point, Jean starts screaming into Scott's head. God, that has to be the worst facet of that marriage right <laughs> it just you could be yelled at on demand but scott's like oh shit i can't leave and then storm knows what's going on is like rogue get cyclops to the to the hospital mm-hmm. and cyclops is still nervous about magneto like in this whole scenario like if there's a time where magneto can unleash and rain down hell and ruin everything for charles's dream this is it mm-hmm. right now yeah i also kind of I was like, wow, like, I guess this is supposed to more establish, like, Scott and Gene's, you know, relationship that mm-hmm. he would leave this important of a fight. It's not only is it a big fight, it's like a pivotal political yeah. moment. It's more than just survival in the moment. It's it's yeah. bigger than that. And then, like, Storm takes charge and has this great scene. I didn't pick it up at first, but this is saw I saw this on, I want to say it was Games Radar or, like, one of those, like, random, like, newsy sites. It was very similar to Captain America's speech in the Avengers where he's like literally positioning the cops to like how you're going to defend this thing right now even to the point of the cop being like who does this guy think he is and Storm's like you're going to shut your mouth if you want to survive this right now yeah and a part of that was you need to take off Magneto's collar and they did it I love it My, my shorthand note here was like this was basically old white guys try to tell a black woman what to do (laughs) <laughs> with no plan of their own of what That's, they were yeah. going to try to even do it's, it's not like they even had any level of counter argument on this they were just trying to be dogmatic about rules in a moment where obviously the rules are thrown out the window yeah exactly like, and yeah but i love how storm is like no this wasn't this wasn't this wasn't a request like i'm just telling you what's happening like, yeah <laughs> yeah you're gonna do this or you're gonna do this done jumps over wolverine is holding a doctor up against a candy machine I, I had here Wolverine almost kills a bigot doctor. Yeah, I mean, because the, the doctor is like, yeah, you know, you you people are, have no control. Because obviously, super scientific doctor, literally the entire series is about people learning to control their power. So he's done so much research. But it's also reads as a I did my own research kind of guy too, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he's refusing to help. Scott arrives. Gene lets him know, and they're like, Scott has a great plan of like, Rogue, can you like learn his shit? And, yeah, and by Rogue, absorbing him. Yeah, and Rogue is like, yeah, but if I accidentally touch your baby, they might. And it's like, oh, you you might kill our child. Is is what she's yeah. saying. And then Jean is like, no, no, we trust you. That was a sweet moment. It was it, a great moment. Um, and then I, I also love how like no one was concerned for the doctor. They shouldn't have been. No, fuck uh, that guy. And, and yeah, it might, it might know here is like, then Rogue kills the doctor. Rogue did not <laughs> do like the like quick touch it was like i'm gonna get a lot out of you right now you're you're gonna be in a coma for a week right i, I, I want to believe uh we should get like the side like the series the mini series of like rogue is a uh, the gray's anatomy doctor 
<laughs> because she absor- she had that guy's knowledge for the next like three hours for the yeah. emergency room and such. But the nurses, zero protest. They are totally cool with helping Rogue on that. Yeah. So yeah, it's either that they're like they're just they have to take what their boss's instructions were. Also, they probably can't deliver the baby on their own, or they're just like fuck this. We don't get paid enough for this. What do you want? <laughs> yeah. Please don't drain me. Yeah. Yeah. And then it jumps back over to the UN where Magneto has made the energy shield that's surrounding him. And I complimented it last episode. I'm going to do it again this one. Just showcasing the visuals of the powers is another level by comparison. Yeah, like he takes all those metal pieces from everything in the room. And this is the foreshadowing we mentioned about the danger room. In yeah. the, was it the last episode? Yeah, last episode. Mm-hmm. Right, um, I'm getting all these mixed up. And he it, makes seven like swords. swords. And like... I didn't know if that was like a reference to like sort of Damocles or whatever, but it was seven Uh swords positioned in such a way that I was like, this has to be some sort of reference. And we just haven't found it yet. But I was like, yeah, that was intentional. Yeah. And then he tells Storm, you know, like do your thing. And then they basically make an electric cage for these animals. Yep. (laughs) Be animals, be caged. And then it's like a, a lightning barrier. And that's when the executioner comes in to the room and pulls up the gun, which, like you said, it's got one shot. And Magneto, as far as I could tell, could not see it. And the executioner takes the shot and Storm gets in there and takes a fucking powerful shot. Like, you literally see her skeleton in the shot. Yeah. Even before she jumped, when executioner barged into that room, I was like, it's going to be Storm. I was already getting upset mm-hmm. in advance because it wasn't going to be anybody else in that room. It definitely wasn't going to be any of the tribunal or anything yeah, like that. But it like, wasn't going to be Val. Yeah. It was just Magneto and they yeah, they weren't going to throw like a human in front of it because it was specifically that collar gun thing. Mm-hmm. I was like it's going to be fucking Storm. They're not going to do that to Storm. I was like maybe it's a maybe it's a tase, you know. I was yeah. holding out hope for like being like, oh, she's out of commission for a week or something. Yeah, nope. she, yeah, she took that. I, I fucking started flipping tables, man. Like, I, I was like, what? Like the, we just got her. Like, I've been waiting thirty years for this storm, and <laughs> and she was amazing. Literally a half hour earlier in your life. Yeah, and I already loved the ninety two storm. This somehow improved on it vastly, and then they just took her away. Granted, we're presuming that this gets resolved later. I've been given some insight of comic storylines that are outlined in the show, the episode titles and stuff. But I still just, even with all that, I, I personally, I'm not saying this for the show in general, don't like the idea of missing episodes of Storm's powers. However, after I calmed down the next morning and thought about it, it had to be her story wise. She's the only one that's not like in a weird love triangle or has 20 other drama things happening. She's someone she, that's like fairly universally loved. Like no one had given a shit if it was Gambit. Also, he's in like his whole whatever that is with yeah. Magneto and Rogue and stuff. And then like it couldn't be Scott or Jean. Jean's already got her things coming up. Oh yeah. And, and uh, like Beast, like it wouldn't have been the same. You know, Beast, it would have been a win, right? <laughs> yeah. But it was just that like on hindsight, like they that's the reason they made her so fucking cool. Right. Until time because they they knew she was already kind of universally pretty much universally loved and then they made like really hammered it home and and then they did this tour and then I was like maybe I'm biased because of like how upset I was but I was like Magneto fucking set this up like he played too good too long even if I still think that he respects Charles enough to carry out his wishes but I feel like he's doing it in his way you know he's like we have to sacrifice one to do this and he's probably not happy it gave me a Thanos and Gamora, Gamora vibe. vibes where I was like. I don't, I don't want to, but I have to for the good of the greater good or whatever. So yeah. I might be, I hope I'm wrong. Well, it doesn't matter now. It happened either way. If it's if I'm wrong or not, but like, it was wild. And then like, I've never been sadder watching a cartoon or an animated show than watching Storm crawl around like a helpless animal on the ground. Like, this is the most heartbreaking thing oh, I've dude. ever seen. Like, you could tell the level of pain that Storm is in. Is this she going fell on. off the stage yeah. on her knees. Like, yeah. that's harsh. And then you see her cry, like, as it wasn't ready i think we've gotten used to the claustrophobic things like oh she's freaking out like let's not that that was panic this was just like i think she just would have crawled off a cliff if it, given the chance at that point and once again magneto is immediately he he, he like takes executioner over he doesn't like, just take executioner over he literally slams him into the ground first twice yeah. like just using all <laughs> the metal in his body he's like i'm going to slam the shit out of you also how 
fucking stupid is the executioner to go in wearing that much metal? He's a digital running research. Yeah. Guy, right? when, <laughs> when, when literally the UN has guns that they know that they like, don't get me wrong. Dr. Cooper didn't do her best fucking job of like not making sure helicopters were nearby. But yeah, like this is the guy who's like, I'm going to take out Magneto. And it's like, oh, you're dumb as shit. Even if you have this yeah. like, you know, total like, you know, hillbilly engineered gun right now. <laughs> Now, to Magneto's credit, and this it goes to a point to disprove my suspicion, he looks kind of confused when he holds up the gun. He's like, what the hell is this? And then he slams Executioner against the UN logo, like a the, those the girls big on, seal. Like the, yeah. Yeah. Like the, those girls that were on the carnival things with the knives. Like he basically, you know, like when they spin. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. Know, like the knife thrower just, thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And I was he, like, I was like, he, like, yeah. <laughs> he turns them upside down. It's like everything's like, what's the most uncomfortable thing we could do right now for to you? And he like point this was another poignant moment. He like kind of he points over at Storm and this is the you know, when she was crying and stuff to Cooper is like like this this is the is this where the path of the high road leads to? And yeah. Cooper's like, We didn't mean for this to happen. And I was like, This all like you get what you look for. So like if you think you can control like rage or hate like that's the mistake of literally everyone in history. Like, you you wanted enough hate to like take care of the X Men or Magneto in this case or whatever, but you thought it would stop there. Like you can contain it somehow, or like it right. was a, an animal to your control. Like, no, is this literal insurrection happening? I think they even said insurrection at one point. They the do show. they do call it an insurrection. Yeah, and like he's like is he he need Magneto as much as he was the enemy of the X Men was like all to their credit, all they've ever tried to do is help you, and then this was her reward. And that's when you see her crying. Like, they even animated it. So it's like a river of tears coming out of Storm's face. And then Storm, actually, it might have been a little bit before this where Storm gives the line of, like, I can't feel the breeze. Like, that shit was heartbreaking. Like, like Allison, I hope you're up for some awards. Right. It was it was literally right before that this is not what we wanted. She says that she can't feel the breeze or the moisture, moisture. or the air. And that's when Jesus. it was like, I was like, oh, that's where Rod starts crying. Yeah, it was right after I like flipped all the furniture in this house. <laughs> yeah, you're simultaneously <laughs> destroying your home and crying. Because it's just like, even if you're not a fan of storms, it's like, it's like you took the blood out of her body, right? Mm-hmm. Like, she's always had this energy coursing through her and it's just taken away. Like, that's wild. Yeah. So then Magneto puts everybody in one of his electric ball things and just launches all of them into space. Well, he he's like, you know, what can we ever do to be good enough? And he's like, I've said this before, but never again. again." And that's where he pulls up the stage in one of his electric balls and then the symbol in a separate one. And they go up into like the atmosphere. And then there's the single shot of Magneto with his back to them because he does not want them to see a moment of weakness. But you see like the tear go down the side of his face. And so that's why I was like, this could go either way. He could have planned it and still been not happy about it. Right. Or and he sees it and it's like more real than he had, you know, imagined. Or it just happened unexpectedly and he's still, you know, holding back from just like squishing everybody. Right. Because he, he was very thoughtful, obviously, about what he's saying. But he he's up there with five people. Mm-hmm. But he literally says, bigot, ingrate, sycophant. And worm. Mm-hmm. I got the impression he is not including Val in that group. Oh, interesting. Like I, th- okay. I think he's talking about the tribunal, and then the worm is obviously the executioner. But I, for some reason, didn't get Val was up there with them, and he's holding her accountable. But I don't think he thinks she's the same as the the three on the tribunal are obviously all pieces of shit. I don't yeah. think he believes she's fully on that side. And so this was the point where I was like, okay, maybe this isn't Mystique because I don't know. If, I don't. I don't know if Magneto would have it in him to orchestrate this thing with her. You know, like right. this far. I was super impressed that he said bigot. They finally said. Like, they, they, finally they dropped said it. The they finally formally said it. Yeah. The show was like yes, and it it felt like poetry coming out of his mouth. Like mm-hmm. just the way they. It, you could see the movement of his lips. It was like, man, okay, they finally, finally did it. And he even goes, he goes as far to say, like, he, you know, he does that kind of like from a distance kind of speech. And he's like, whether we don't even have to like each other, we just have to acknowledge that we have a shared world and like a common future. Yep, and, and we just have the right to live there. Yeah, it kind of a bigger zoomed out view of the Morlocks and the sewer. Yeah, 
I mean, he he led into that by saying, like, an old friend challenged me and it reminded him of this view of the earth where it's like the vastness of all this versus how small we make everything and interspersed in that is like Jean going through her contractions and the delivery and stuff like that, too. Mm -hmm. And I like that he even says, like, I'm trying to be better. Please do not make me let you down. That is the that is the fucking (laughs) darkest way of saying i'm going to be better but it's yeah but it hits it's true it's like it's his way of being the most true yeah like truthful. i'm i'm on the line that i'm about to break right now yeah because he had executioner's face under his he- literal heel like i could because he could just drop them he'd be like oops yep he's like i don't higher. i don't i don't even need to drop you too i could literally just step on your face and leave you yeah I like the little detail too. Right when they got into space, you can see like the tribunal's breath. They kind of kind of show like they're not suffocated yet, but they're high enough that the temperature has changed. Yeah, like wow, he's, he's literally just holding him in that like purgatory. Yep, just to give this speech, and then it jumps to the happy baby. <laughs> so there are laughing children, I guess. But there, it wasn't <laughs> laughing. Yeah, and they were not they were not waving flags and, right. and such and banners in the air. And then of course Gene has to be like, he has your eyes. And it's like, God, your your husband probably has awful eyes. Makes you wonder, like, was did they go on an adventure where she's she did see them at some point, right? Yeah. Some savage land thing or something. Yeah, yeah. So. And then he's like, What do you want to name him? And it's Nathan, which we all knew was gonna be the thing, and then it's yeah. Nathan Charles out of respect to, you know, Professor X and stuff like that. I love how like naming him Nathan is almost like cursing the kid you know it's like oh you're gonna have a rough we um, we all know what's happening to nathan guys right it's like oh maybe no. just for his sake you name him jack or something just something right nice. so he's, i mean gene doesn't want to fuck with the time stream man yeah so wolverine is standing at the door is sad it's like the modern version of the the classic meme of like sad wolverine is there making out in the background and they lean in for a kiss and when the camera shows the opposite angle wolverine's gone mm-hmm. and he knows when to fuck off then we cut to news reports of magneto being pardoned by dr cooper oh this is where they say the news reporter says that there was an insurrection they say all the words like yeah. they they don't they make sure it's like no we're not implying anything we're saying it like, yeah it, they, they literally say he's pardoned because partially because of him aiding and shutting down the insurrection basically yeah. and then <laughs> They mentioned that Age is going to Genosha and that Genosha is going to be up for consideration to join the UN. But the they zoom out to reveal that Magneto and Scott are watching it together. And Scott like, comes up with a cup of coffee and Magneto <laughs> goes, poison? Dark like, roast. Yeah. Which might be the same thing. I don't know. I'm more of a medium guy. I need the caffeine. I think Scott says, like, Genosha part of the UN, like, would have thought there was a you know, never thought I would see the day. I kind of, and I was like, well, this is kind of a parallel. Like, I just never thought I'd see the day my favorite show as a kid being continued in my 40s and also would be as good, maybe better than the original. Right. Like, we're, we're in the, we're kind of in the same mindset, dude. Like, and then there's the, the moment where it was like, oh, I heard you guys are still leaving. Does that mean you trust me? And Scott says, well, if Charles trusted you and I trust him, that's got to be as good enough. best it's going to be for us. Yeah. And this is another thing for this this voice actor. He was able to get through the same dialogue could have been delivered by Scott in ninety two, and it would have come across as an asshole. This one came across as like a lot more like neutral. Like he wasn't ecstatic about it, but he also wasn't like it uh, didn't come across it. as snarky either. Yeah, yeah. He was like, "Well, gonna go with what I know and not my feelings." Yep, and that's what we're gonna we're gonna see. Yeah. <laughs> And then Magneto gives a little bit of unsolicited advice, but he's like, be wary, be vigilant. Tragedy usually comes with fortune first. And it was like, oh, it's like, yeah, you're literally telling this to a dude who just had a baby. And he's like, you know, this was a good week for our people, but not without cost. And then it jumps over to the lab where Beast is looking at a blood sample on a microscope. And as he's doing it and he's taking like a long time to explain, it's like, there's no way this is good news. There's literally no way this could be fucking good news. And I love how Storm is, she's smart enough to be like, don't, don't drag this out. Just tell me the punchline. Like, well, cause he's like, is- you know, it might be like some testing and she's like, how long? And he just has to jump into it. He's like permanent. Yes, it feels permanent. And yeah, what you mentioned before, he explains it like the collars turned out to be radiation that 
suppress like mutant abilities and they were able to like put in like a i guess like a tranquilizer form or whatever yeah like, inject it directly into you it is wild it just kind of when he said that it kind of made me think like is this how sinister gets involved in all this because of all this genetic stuff with mutants and things like he he somehow fixes storm Maybe. i don't know the i don't know the life death storyline so if some other people probably know how this works but and, and also if you do agree. don't spoil it for us either yeah. Like, like it's one thing when we go through the episode and like we talk about like what what did happen compared to what happened, but like don't proactively toss that kind of stuff in the comments. Yeah, and um, I love there's like a small detail that I did notice when Storm has like the dog whistle pitch, you know, and she's like, kind yeah, of yeah, accepting what's happening. That Jean says like, let's call Mirror Island. Is like, oh, we're we gonna get Moira. See, I was so focused on the white noise from it that I yeah. actually didn't even hear Gene say that. But yeah, it was totally. Only, it was only the second time around because I knew the first time I watched, I was like, she said something. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's not the forefront. But the second time around, I was like, what's she saying? And she's like, I, she said something about calling Muir Island. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, it like, makes sense because this is not an awful version of Moira. So yeah. Or the, the multiple versions of Moira in the movies that aren't related to each other. I mean, the current Moira in the comics is the worst version oh, of really? Moira. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the, the Moira's in the the Fox X-Men movies, there's two different ones decades apart that aren't related to each other at all. Fine. <laughs> it's Fox. Doesn't matter. Deadpool's going to kill literally all of them. Yeah. And then Storm goes back to her room. Yeah, man, this is another heartbreaking thing. There's a lightning strike and it scares her. I didn't even realize that I had never seen that before. Yeah, I mean, it was the... She is... It never would have scared her because she would have known it was coming. Yeah, she would have felt it or she would have caused it or yeah. whatever. Like, And that is... That was wild. And then just it just cuts to the envelope with Jean's name on it. Mm-hmm. You're like, you know, you saw the earrings. Like, with the, with the two too. lightning earrings, because she doesn't even feel like she has control over that anymore. And this was what I mentioned, what I thought about, like, with the Dark Phoenix thing in the intro. And then with Storm and Jean talking about stuff earlier when she was packing. Storm in her letter, which Jean is reading to the group, says, like, everything's about connections. And they, they don't have this connection anymore. Yeah. And I was like, man, so she kind of like just pulled the plug herself on everything instead of trying to give it a shot. She's just already like, yeah, this is, well, you know. she and she also dropped like a very pointed but not like negative set, like statement where she was like, you've had to say goodbye multiple times. Like, and yeah, and essentially is like, I'm not strong enough to do it with everybody. That that's what I thought with the Dark Phoenix thing was mentioning is like oh yeah she's been Phoenix like twenty times now so like, she knows how it is to die a, a few times right which Cause, more right because in the the Dark Phoenix saga if anybody doesn't remember it like Jean basically went into that knowing she was going to either die or have to sacrifice herself like there was mm-hmm. there was not a way in Jean's mind that she thought she was going to survive that event so yeah yeah and so the, it segues from Storm's voice to Jean's as she, they reveal that she's reading it to the group. Well, you get a few clips in there. You see Scott with the baby. And because she's talking about Storm is mentioning her faith that she has in her family. More about connection with like, you know, the, you know, the nature to want to be held and seen and felt by another soul. And that's where you see Rogue and Magneto in the office and they they make contact with each other. Someone tried to explain this to me. I guess this is a this is precedented. Like he's able to create like a magnetic field or something. Yeah, essentially. And that, may, that requires so much explanation. Well, but it's like, it's the whole thing of like technically we never actually touch each other because our mm-hmm. atoms can't actually touch, kind of thing. Yeah. It's just using the magnetic field to do that. Basically. Yeah. I guess it's just an extension of whatever Magneto did for Xavier's mind powers in the graduation day. <laughs> and it's talking more about connection. Morph shows up with beer as Wolverine's oh, yeah. in the tree. Wolverine's like not wanting to pay attention morph chucks two bags of chips at wolverine and then wolverine turns and morph has turned into saber tooth and they play like cats yeah yeah they're and, <laughs> yeah they wolverine jumps out of the tree and then he he fucking slices the beer with his claws and that was not what morph's intention was so right. yeah let's see gambit outside and uh, out, outside of the room that rogue and magneto were in mm-hmm. i might just be reading too much into this but like it and only because we've kind of established this is not a rated G show. Yeah. It kind of implies that like Rogue and Magneto had like a real quick hookup. Or at least Gambit a makeout out session or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And Gambit heard enough. Yeah. Like just basically because I feel like them going to the room just to touch hands wouldn't have been enough for you to hear outside. Yes. To know, or to assume, you know. 
people are alone together all the time in that house. I, I don't, and at least in my knowledge, he doesn't have any precedented like suspicion right. of them being a thing. So it just feel like something physical and like intimate happened that he was able to overhear enough, and then he drops the card. Like that's like really hard. That's his like sad Wolverine in the picture thing, yeah. right? Like he drops the charge card that yeah. like, loses the charge. There was there was like one quick comment that Gambit made earlier about like communication or trust or something like that, but it wasn't enough that it was like a full fledged suspicion. So I totally agree with you on that. And then you see Storm getting on the bus and she mentions how they're no longer connected, meaning her and Jean, that they're now living in different worlds. And it feels like the other memories she have are already a lifetime away. And it just sucks because literally she was saying like, I've daydreamed about what it would be like to be right. human. And she kind of got her wish. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, it's weird because like, or not weird. I feel like kind of reflects a little bit of real life in the sense that I feel like a lot of people, myself included, say that about lockdown and COVID. It's like it's almost like the life we lived before 2020 was something told to us more than lived, you know, or at least for me and a couple people I talked to. It's like, yeah, I know technically I lived through that, but like it just feels, I don't know, like a, a different side of the yeah. record or something. There's something off about it. And I would say for me, it felt it just felt longer ago than it actually was on paper. Like somehow it, longer and shorter, right? <laughs> like that feels like we just got out of it. But yeah, it was like that was ten years ago, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, that's when it's it's Gene is reading it to the room, and Scott blames himself for it, and everybody was like, she made the choice. Like yeah, you Beast you couldn't like, have done anything differently. Yeah. yeah, Beast said you you did what you had to do and so did she. Yeah, because no one could have predicted that that was going to be the outcome. Granted, mm-hmm. I did say like earlier, I was like, that's a hard thing to leave. You know, I know your child's being born, but mm-hmm. like, man, it's a weird time. Magneto's and, like, and we're going to respect her decision. We are not going to try to find her and bring her back. And that's another one of those things where like, he's so cryptic. It's like, I genuinely can't tell if you're being respectful or if you had something to do with this. Yeah. Like, it could, it, to me, it like at that point, it was like a little bit either way. Gambit has the really quick, like, yeah, that shot was aimed for you. So it really should be you leaving. But here we are. I, I think that was the most frustrating thing to me. It's like, yes, you should be gone. Granted, we have no season. It would right. end in two episodes. But but also, I, you, you, but you also it's Gambit's now partially spiteful. Aside from the storm stuff, now he's also personally spiteful with, with this whole rogue suspicion. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. For him, it's a double scenario. It's like you literally, mm-hmm. it's you're taking my girl, and my friend is no longer a part of this team because of you. Yeah. And then Morph. I know that they did this on purpose to give Morph the line of like Morph's like, no, no, she'll she'll spend like a day with normal people and then be right back because like I like that Morph was the one that everyone thought died yeah. and then came back, and we don't know what's happening with Storm. Storm's kind of like the the morph of this this the sacrifice that got made kind of scenario yeah Yeah. only it's a little bit heavier this time because we know fully who she is yeah it's not the first like 27 minutes of seeing a character yeah Yeah, that also wasn't like precedent like i didn't know about morph before you know don't worry a lot of people didn't know about morph before changeling or whatever yeah exactly and and then you know cartoon timing doorbell rings and morph's like ah see and they run over you know more about this part and then (laughs) other gene says I need the X-Men and faints. And then it is everybody shocked. And then they do that thing with like focus. Like I think it's, is there a rack focus? Oh, a rack focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it starts as Scott being in focus. And then it shows Gene, Gene who's been in the building, Gene. And I didn't get the impression of that Gene being shocked. I got a little bit more of Gene being pissed from the way her face was animated. Yeah, like I thought, get rid of you. Yeah. So you know what's funny is I only caught on to this this storyline from like I think everybody started talking about this once the toys came out and Gene was shown as pregnant. There was the Funko Pop of Madeline Pryor uh-huh. holding the kid, and which was a New York Comic Con exclusive. I want to say. Yeah, I for, I forget. Do you keep up with Rick and Morty? Yes. So I I finally kind of see like where they got like the Beth storyline from. Mm-hmm. Like, where they're being cloned Beths and stuff, and nobody knows which one's which. It's like, oh, okay, so that was something probably from, like, loosely an X-Men-related, like, inspiration or something. Mm Because there's, like, these mom in outer space, and no one really knows which one's which. And 
neither do the clones themselves and then, so they're just so they're just like we're just gonna assume we're both real yeah, yeah. so i genuinely don't know where this storyline goes besides cable i've heard you mean various- nathan what Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Actually, it's funny. I literally know Cable, and then I kind of caught on to the Nathan stuff. And then I've seen vague implications of, like, the retconning of the cloning, and it didn't start that way and all that stuff. So I'm kind of coming this fresh to see how this, like, kind of hopefully cleaned up timeline of this story goes. I I think the, the difference between this and the comic run of it is it's planned from the beginning yeah. as opposed to parts of it were planned and then you had different writers and there were retcons and changes with editorial over time. I think because there's fewer episodes to deal with, it keeps it cleaner. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I meant by the retcon stuff is like, from my understanding, it wasn't this clone thing or the Madeline Pryor. Like it was, yeah, it wasn't this clone story or whatever, but there was like backlash from fans or something. And then Killing Gene, and, yeah, it was not loved and, by people. And so then... It turned into this more complex story, but yeah, like you said, didn't start that way. So, but yeah, it, it was never reviled the same way the Spider-Man Clone Saga was reviled. Morbius, the movie. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> we're not. People would need to like, see it to really revile it. So, <laughs> I'm less worried about Morbius. Now that we're getting a sense of the show, we're gonna be frustrated every Wednesday because it's almost guaranteed that they're gonna have a cliffhanger like this ever after every episode. <laughs> but, dude, I'm not gonna lie. I love this as a week to week. I yeah. feel like especially the shit that they have hit if you did this as a single weekend drop or something like that it would be just hype 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 dead yeah and also like the it would take away from like the the fun of the cliffhangers yeah i actually told a friend today who they were they were like oh like so how's the show and i was like man i sent him the screenshot of the rotten tomatoes 100 percent score and he was like oh damn he's like i better hurry he's he just finished season three of 92 okay and i was like okay I'm going to be real with you. If you want to avoid spoilers, because somehow you've avoided them to this point, you're not going to last longer than today. If I were you, now that I've rewatched everything, I would say you got through the first three seasons. That's probably the most important chunk. You can probably skip to the finale, then watch this show, and then catch up with season four and five in between new... I, I would maybe add in Beyond Good and Evil, and then the finale. But I, I think, unfortunately, for season five, like, those episodes were such non-factors because they were all kind of, like, standalones, you know? I, I told him, I gave him, I forget what numbers it was. I was, like, like nine through something. Don't yeah. even worry about right now because, like, one of them is literally Jubilee telling kids fairy tale stories. Yep. So, whatever. But I was like, I think the only hard knowledge you need to know now is what happened in graduation day. And then you won't be confused for episode one and two. But it might be fun for you instead of trying to cram you know, three years of or two years of episodes into like a couple days. It might be more fun to, since you haven't seen them, to watch the new show and then fill the time in between with the last couple seasons of the previous one if you haven't watched them yet. Right. But I'm saying that to anyone listening that for some reason, if somehow you came into this just watching 97 and you're not sure what to watch, yeah. To binge, I would say like, yeah, if you got mostly through the first half of the series, you would be pretty safe to just catch up with the finale and then catch up. I would advise that over trying to just binge everything and then catch up with the show and avoid spoilers. Like, that's insane. I would also look at the previously on X-Men Instagram account because it actually mentions specific episodes by name. And I do think that there's a little bit of the like, you know, we're, we're not going to give you a quintessential watch list of 45 episodes to get caught up for for this. It's like, I think they narrowed it down to like maybe 11 or 12 episodes of like across oh, everything. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The only final piece of trivia, you know, we mentioned the trial of Magneto, which is where Scott retires from the X-Men. Nathan is born in issue 201 of the comic. So literally the next issue is when he was born. Oh, nice. Yep. Okay. And then, oh, sorry. The gun that has this power effect on Storm was originally made by Forge because Forge was working with the U.S. government at that point. Mm. And Storm took the shot for Rogue in the comics when this story took place. That would have been less frustrating. (laughs) Um, But this story took place 15 full issues before the trial of Magneto. It took place in, in 185. It was kind of condensed. Like I I think it, it was it was changing the the goal of it too. Yeah. Like I said it, at the beginning of this recording, this episode took me like through like a full set of emotions. So successful writing and TV. Frustrating for the eleven year old who just wanted to see lightning. But you know, 
it, I have to concede it's good writing. Yeah. Like every, everyone cares about storm in this. It is give so. it is giving the character that you love the most, like such an integral plot point. Yeah. So it's, she's going to be yeah, important. Right. Then. And it, it doesn't feel like what happened with beast in the first season of 92, where he was like locked up. Like, oh, yeah. like this is like, Oh, this is, this is major shit. You know? Yeah. Cause once again, I don't know the storyline of the, of what she goes through in the comics and stuff, but I just saw little hints that I might be just projecting on or whatever, but I noticed like the little, I think it might've been boss or some sort of like Africanish statue in her room and things. I'm like, man, how, how deep are they going to go with this? Is she going to be healed by sinister? Is she going to go to Wakanda? Like what's, what's going on here? You know, like there's this other journey. Anytime a character gets on a bus, you know, that like that's the B plot. We're going to see what happens. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. It's that, it's that, well, you know, better as a writer, whatever, when you take away the fantastical part of a character and, see like what they are so this is the first time we're going to see like what storm is is like a little a literal person right i mean one of the the most interesting stories that i remember reading from the like was probably the 80s i could be wrong on the time frame on it but it was around secret war i want to say was when ben Grimm lost his powers of being the thing oh. yeah so dissecting a character like that it's always yeah. interesting all right rod i think we've hit everything and yeah these are going to be longer episodes for this season because they're denser episodes too they're 30 full i don't count the credit time so like 30 full minutes i know like they're not like 30 minutes like on tv in the 90s where they're actually 22 minutes because they're adding like it's a solid 29 to 30 minutes yeah Yeah. so i think the yeah the official runtime is like 32 minutes so yeah there's probably two or three minutes of credit credits yeah. or whatever they, we still watch because it's that 3d action scene thing but uh, yeah anyway i do my best to figure it out please forgive any mistakes that might be happening in this if you hear weird sounds or something i did my best with this i i do have to say <laughs> as we wrap up tonight your cat has been the chillest they have ever been we have never gone this late on a recording and lucy hasn't moved this entire she's like repositioned herself a few times but never like like normally by 10 o'clock she's like whacking you in the face for attention right i i did play with her a bit before this to make sure she was tired but this is still impressive like she is she's usually like recharged by now so oh now you're just glaring okay yeah we gotta feed her yeah (laughs) you should feed your cat it is after midnight so okay so thanks for joining us if you have any thoughts make sure to drop them in the comments for either the youtube upload or official instagram post about this episode if you like what you heard we'd appreciate a rating on the podcast app you're choosing you can find us on apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, amazon music spotify youtube podcast and Castbox. I'm gonna go. I gotta start editing right now. <laughs> <laughs>